So Grey's Anatomy is a medical drama. It's actually one of my favorites. It's about the personal and professional lives of five surgical interns and their supervisors. It's surprisingly addictive. Episodes are a combination of soap opera, drama, comedy, and legitimate medical practice, which is a lot like reality in teaching hospitals, places where you're like, you can't make this up, happen over and over. This episode depicts a heart transplant operation, truly one of the greatest miracles of modern medicine. Certain hospitals that care for the sickest of the sick, we call them tertiary care centers, may perform heart transplant. When heart disease and heart failure becomes so severe that it's untreatable, the only way to save the individual's life is to give them a new heart. A heart from a healthy person. Heart transplant is very successful and it's wonderful to save life in such dramatic fashion. But there's also plenty of paradoxes. One person's tragedy is the price of another person's joy. And while transplant represents a new lease on life, it's also like trading one disease for another. Heart failure for all the complexities of managing a transplant and the consequences of immunosuppression, such as infection and cancer. But there's something very peculiar, almost spooky about heart transplant, and it may be the donor who has the last laugh. So stay with me, we'll talk about that. Let's put this in perspective. In the United States, roughly 50,000 individuals are in need of a heart transplant at any one time. However, organs are in very short supply, so only 2,000 transplants are performed each year. Candidates are carefully screened to ensure that their heart disease is truly end stage, but they can still survive the operation, and that they can keep up with the continuous care that the transplanted organ will require. Those who truly need a heart but don't qualify, or when none is available, will likely die within months. Each transplant requires a donor, a living heart from another person. It's an anonymous gift. The new heart must come from someone who's been declared brain dead, which is usually the result of a head injury from a car accident, gunshot wound, or major bleed into the brain like a stroke. If the family consents to donate the organs, a transplant database is then used to perform a nationwide search to find a suitable match. This is based on blood type, size, and age. Race and gender have no bearing. The chest of the brain dead organ donor is then opened, exposing the heart, which is carefully removed. The major vessels that attach the heart to the body are simply cut at the midpoint, and the heart is placed in a refrigerated container that looks a lot like a cooler. The heart is then immediately transported, usually by airplane or helicopter, to the location of the recipient where the transplant operation will be performed. And the clock is running. The total time from organ harvest to transplant is known as the ischemic time. This is the total time without a native blood supply. The total ischemic time must be kept as short as possible to ensure viability of the organ. And when the heart arrives, the surgical team is in the operating room with the patient receiving the heart transplant. Everyone's ready to go. Depending on circumstances with the donor, this could be any time, day or night. The team retrieves the heart from the transportation cooler, and if it looks good, meaning viable, the recipient's chest is opened and the diseased heart is exposed. On the operating table, the patient is transitioned to cardiopulmonary bypass meaning a heart-lung machine, also known as the pump, that's what the Gray's Anatomy cast is calling it, takes over the function of the heart and lungs. So the heart isn't needed, meaning it can be completely removed from the body. The pump has taken over, as is happening here. With the patient's chest wide open, the surgical team lifts the very sick heart out of the patient's body. The diseased heart, now removed, is held up for all to see, and comments are made about its poor condition. The LV is severely dilated, which is spoken with great wisdom. And then another voice. He wouldn't have lasted another hour with this heart. Look at that thing. Yeah, left ventricle is excessively dilated. He wouldn't have lasted another hour with this heart. No, he wouldn't have. It's all pretty accurate. So now it's time to implant the donor's heart. In reality, this step takes six to 10 hours, depending. The new heart is placed into the chest and carefully sutured into place. The major blood vessels are reattached. Two veins, the superior and inferior vena cava, and two major arteries, the pulmonary artery and aorta. The entire posterior left atrial wall is then attached, which contains all four pulmonary veins. Anatomy, this takes all of three seconds. The new heart is already in place and the team is congratulating Dr. Hunt on his beautiful work. 
It's beautiful work, Doctor. Totally unrealistic, but that's television. For a few brief instants, we get to see the entire operating suite for Open Heart. And here the show is pretty realistic. So let's fast forward to the next critical step, which is taking the patient off cardiopulmonary bypass and seeing if the heart will beat spontaneously. Remember, this is after a six to 10 hour surgery and the heart hasn't beat on its own since it was placed in the cooler. Dr. Teddy Altman takes over. The hard part is still to come, says Altman, and it's coming off bypass that she's talking about. Let's see if the heart will beat on its own, says Altman, with cautious optimism, knowing the patient has no options if this heart can't rebound. Hard part is still to come. All right, let's start taking them off bypass. See if this heart will beat on its own. Nothing. Come on, Denny. Beat for me, and she drops into her low vocal pitch to add to the drama. No response. Charge to 20. Clear. And the heart doesn't beat. So Dr. Altman gives the go-ahead to deliver a low-level shock, 20 joules of energy, direct to the heart. All right, come on, Danny. Beat for me. This is realistic. The heart should be healthy. It is well perfused. It may just need some encouragement to start beating on its own again. The shock energy can provide an influx of calcium to the heart muscle, which promotes contraction. So the 20 joule shock is delivered and still nothing. Dr. Altman pumps the heart manually a few times, completely realistic. The team is waiting and each second feels like an eternity. The camera pans to the patient, then to Dr. Izzy Stevens, who's watching from the viewing gallery above the OR. Still no heartbeat and you can cut the tension with a knife. One voice thinks the situation is becoming futile, asking Dr. Hunt to take over. Dr. Hunt, wait for it. Dr. Hahn. Just wait. But Altman is adamant. Wait for it. And then bingo, the heart starts to contract. And the monitor shows the electrical signal with that reassuring beep that occurs with each heartbeat. It's a huge relief. And that's how we raise the dead in Erica Land. And that's how we raise the dead in Miracle Land, declares Dr. Altman. As the team carries on, Dr. Stevens is overcome with emotion. She slumps against the gallery wall to shed a few tears as if she's just witnessed a miracle. It's a little over the top, but hey. Again, I love Gray's anatomy for trying to capture hospital culture. Now, let's talk about what happens after transplant. It's a total surprise, but we found that the recipient may display certain personality traits, preferences, and even character features from the donor. It's as though the transplanted heart contains the mind and soul of the donor, which then finds expression in the recipient. So while heart transplant is extending the life of the recipient, it's also giving new life to the donor. An example, Kevin Mashford received the heart of a man who died in a cycling accident. Without any prior interest in cycling, Kevin discovered a passion for cycling after transplant. Bill Wall was a top executive with no interest in exercise. In 2000, he received the heart of Brady Michaels, a Hollywood stuntman who died in a freak accident. Bill then became a competitive athlete, winning numerous medals. A few weeks after the operation, Bill heard a radio song by British music star Sade, an artist he had never heard of before. And Bill burst into tears. The donor family later confirmed that Brady Michaels was a huge fan of Sade. A more dramatic example is the story of Claire Sylvia. 
At age 47, she received a heart and lung transplant from an 18-year-old boy killed in a motorcycle accident. Sylvia awoke from the transplant operation craving beer, which she had never wanted previously. And she had a strange new taste for other foods, Snickers bars, green peppers, Kentucky Fried Chicken takeaway. In the weeks to follow, Claire found that she was more aggressive and assertive than before the transplant and more confident as well. She felt tougher and fitter and stopped getting colds. Even her walk became more manly. She felt a new power that she associated with strength and vibrancy. She noted that her timid side had fallen away and she didn't feel the same need to have a boyfriend. When it appeared to her in a dream, he gave her his name, Tim Lamorant, and they promised never to be separated. Using the information she received from Tim's heart, Sylvia looked up his family, who confirmed his taste for beer, peppers, Snickers bars, and KFC. He had all the confidence and swagger in the world and excellent health. Sylvia lived for 22 more years with Tim's heart, then passed away at age 69. Here's another case. An eight-year-old girl received the heart of a 10-year-old female murder victim. The girl started having dramatic post-operative nightmares about the murder of another young girl. Her psychiatrist perceived the dreams to be genuine memories from the donor. The details in the dreams were so accurate that the murderer was identified and arrested. This transplant stuff can take strange twists. At age 57, Sonny Graham received the heart of a 33-year-old man who committed suicide. Thankful for the heart, Graham began writing letters to the donor's family to express his gratitude. In January 1997, Graham met his donor's widow, Cheryl, then age 28. I felt like I had known her for years, Graham recalls. I couldn't keep my eyes off her. I just stared. They were married in 2004. Twelve years after the transplant operation, Graham died the same way the donor did, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. We can only speculate how the love attraction and suicidal tendencies of the original donor shaped the destiny of Sonny Graham. So how does your heart behave like a brain? The heart is literally home to our personality, preferences, character, and memory. The heart at least shares these functions with the brain, playing a much larger role than we ever realized. Consistent with this, recipients of a total artificial heart, where the entire heart is replaced with a machine, will completely lose their emotion, warmth, and empathy. So this is not to be underestimated. So why is there this heart-brain duality? We don't know. What we can appreciate is that the heart and brain are electrical organs. The heart muscle itself generates electric current and consequently the electrical density of the heart is 5,000 times stronger than the brain. So each pulsation of the heart generates a large electromagnetic aura that surrounds us. The field is strong within three to four feet of most people and can be measured up to 10 feet away. And there is a second energy field closer to our core arising from the flow of cerebral spinal fluid up and around the spine. That fluid is composed of electrically charged proteins, which creates electrical current with an associated energy field. And the heart contains its own complex system of nerves, which are densely connected to the brain, allowing the heart and brain to continuously influence each other. Given the nerve plexi localized to the heart, and the resonant energy arising from the muscle itself, it's not surprising that the heart possesses brain-like activity. The brain-like role of the heart is far larger than we imagined and clearly may be transferred to the next person in the setting of transplant. One consequence of this is that your electromagnetic field energy is overlapping and shaping the energy of those around you. So your presence is literally modulating the energetic interactions within and between their heart and mind. Your presence is changing their internal state and their experience of reality. These influences exist without transplant and may be strong enough to continue post-transplant. And the influence between individuals is much stronger with physical contact. Here we see brainwave recordings measured in microvolts and heart recordings measured in millivolts for two individuals seated four feet apart. After holding hands for only five minutes, the electrical signature of the heart appears in the brainwaves of the other person. 
In dramatic fashion, this demonstrates how physical contact with another person may imprint their physiology with your electrical signature. The result could be altered awareness, perception, or interpretation because of you. These effects exist without transplant and may be strong enough to continue post-transplant. We can only speculate on how durable these influences may become with repeat exposure. However, there are some ancient clues. This may be what the book of Genesis is saying about marriage, where a man is joined to his wife and they become one flesh. Heart rhythm synchronization also results from energetic interactions between two individuals. Here we see the heart rate variability patterns for two female friends in close proximity while both are consciously feeling mutual appreciation. The beat by beat changes in heart rate, which occurs naturally in each person, become synchronized when those individuals are close by and in a receptive state generated by feelings of appreciation. Again, a powerful demonstration of our ability to influence others just by our presence, which is amplified in a receptive state. These effects may continue in the setting of transplant where recipients are wise to maintain a receptive disposition towards the foreign organ they are now hosting. As a final example, here's a case of heart rhythm synchronization or entrainment between a boy and his dog. When they are separated, both have an erratic pattern of heart rate variability. After being united with the boy feeling love for his dog, heart rhythm entrainment occurs. Their heart rates and the amplitude of variability oscillations converge. When they later separate, the erratic and independent patterns reappear. Another powerful example of the electrical interactions between living creatures, which is strengthened by positive emotion. These effects may continue post-transplant. So to summarize, heart transplant is an awesome gift of life, where the tragedy of one person is needed for another to triumph. But the transplanted heart may have the last laugh, so to speak, by hijacking the life of its recipient. This could mean a new interest in sports, or in music, or a romantic partner. The heart may avenge its murderer or compel its host to kill yet again. Whatever the case may be, we can gain a new appreciation for our physiology, the strong electromagnetic influences that arise from within us, and the field-like interactions between heart and mind. The emotional state that we allow to resonate inside of us imprints on our heart and dictates the quality of the energy that we broadcast, determining our opportunities and success with others in so many imperceptible ways.